gonna talk today about nanotechnology. Now, as you probably know, there are about two kinds of people in the world. One whose lives have been greatly affected by nanotechnology and the Amish community. And I was really oh. expecting more people to laugh at that. <laughs> Oh yeah, so the list of things that nanotechnology is influencing our lives is almost endless. Well, we can approximate it to be endless. And so it's affected medicine, it's affected biology, it's affected green technology. And so for this nanotechnology talk, we brought you the man who in fact brought nanotechnology into the public eye. Or so is blamed for creating the word that nanotechnology. And today we've got Dr. Eric Drexler, who's a pioneering scientist in molecular nanotechnology and also a great publicizer of the subject. And he's done lots of work, especially at the Oxford Martin School, and today he's going to talk about how he's going to rewrite the 21st century. So it's going to be really cool, and I hope you enjoy it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So the title that I thought might be a good title for this talk is Remaking the 21st Century. And what I mean by that is the prospect of having the coming decades be very different from what people expect because of a fundamental change in the physical technology base that we, we operate our, our, our civilization on. Uh, you mentioned nanotechnology and what its effects are. The main effect is the, are the effects of the $100 billion nanotechnology manufacturing industry in the world today and its products. We call them uh, cell phones, computers, in general, integrated circuit chips today. They, they entered the world of nanoscale features over a decade ago. They're now deep into the nanoscale range. They're intricate systems with billions of nanoscale components working together at high frequencies doing complex operations. And it's very odd that this nanoelectronics is not called nanotechnology, while work in material science is. And as we'll see, another oddity is that the main area of advance in the kind of nanotechnology that in the long term I think will be of, of overwhelming importance, which is the molecular nanotechnology, the advances there in atomically precise fabrication have been primarily in the molecular sciences and again, aren't called nanotechnology. So uh, one of the reasons I say blamed for uh, the net term nanotechnology is that it has become very confusing. And I'm more inclined currently to speak in terms of atomically precise fabrication and atomically precise manufacturing. So if you think about the difference between uh, the old stone age and the new stone age and the industrial revolution and today, uh, it becomes rather obvious that what we can do in the world depends overwhelmingly on what we can make. If you can build spacecraft, you can go into space, and if you can't, you don't. Uh, if you can build nanoelectronics, you can have an information technology revolution, and if you can't build those kinds of systems, you don't get those results. So the prospect of a fundamental transformation in the way that we make things opens the prospect of a fundamental transformation in the range of capabilities that the human race has, the problems that we face, the problems that we no longer face, and the sorts of considerations that are shaping expectations of the 21st century and uh, strategic moves by nations like China and the United States, many dangerous developments and that are based on expectations that may prove to be wrong. And I think it's important to get our expectations in line with reality, if we can get a better picture of what that reality might be. So I'd like to say sometimes, there's nothing small about nanotechnology. It's really about fundamental structures in the world and scalable technologies that can have a very large impact. And just to anchor the idea of very large impact, uh, we have a, a trillion ton uh, atmospheric carbon problem these days which is looking rather intractable with present industrial technologies. But there is a sense in which this can be viewed as a manufacturing problem. I, I think it's, it's useful to take a stance which says that if a problem can be addressed by, uh, substantially solved by proper applications of a new manufacturing technology, then one can consider the problem to be a manufacturing technology problem. An example, if we were able to make today uh, low cost, lightweight, easily deployable, efficient 
photovoltaic arrays and also inexpensive, effective uh, means of, of store of interconverting uh, electrical and chemical energy, uh, making carbon neutral liqu liquid fuels, a few other operations like that, we would be able to rapidly deploy an infrastructure that would make coal-fired power plants, gas-fired power plants uneconomical. They would no longer be built. And if this infrastructure were sufficiently inexpensive, no one could afford to burn coal anymore. It would simply be not economical. The reason we can't do that is a manufacturing problem. We cannot make the requisite physical systems at low enough cost and large enough quantities. And I will return to issues of energy and uh, climate change, climate disruption, uh, a little bit later, and talk about prospects for actually reversing the accumulation of greenhouse gases rather than slowing emissions and then waiting for geophysical processes to draw atmospheric levels down over a period of decades and with a, a tail extending to centuries as natural processes would do. So this is a talk that's in some sense about the future, but in some sense it isn't. And to understand that there is knowledge to be had here, not just you know, speculation and projection and gee, maybe this will happen and maybe that will happen. To understand that there is actual testable, reliable knowledge to be had, it's important to understand what the question is. So, what I've asked is a, is a different question. Standard questions. People maybe try to predict scientific discoveries. Well, that's absurd. Uh, if, you, if you knew what the discovery would be, you'd already know it, and it's a, so it's a logical contradiction. Predicting specific technological developments. Well, uh, future in inventions have again and again and again been surprising. It's very hard to predict what will, what will be invented by ingenious people in the future, and therefore this kind of prediction is also not very practical. Winning technologies, you know, 10 years from now, what will be the dominant technology in this area or that area? Often unknown because it depends on a balance of, of competitive technologies, it depends on the development of standards, a uh, range of market forces. What one can do is ask questions about the timeless potential of technology. Because the potential of technology is something that is dependent on physical law and not dependent on anything else. And by potential, I mean what kinds of physical artifacts can exist and what kinds of behaviors can they exhibit. Uh, if you look at the, the structure of, of mathematical proof, this whole world that people are still exploring of mathematics is in some sense implicit in a set of axioms. The whole world of potential technologies is in some set, in, sense implicit in the laws of physics. And just as we can uh, analyze and model systems that can't be built, you know, one can understand a lot about planets without being able to build a planet, uh, just as we can plan trajectories for spacecraft through the outer solar system before actually flying a spacecraft on that trajectory, one can use physical law to understand something about the potential of technology if you ask the right questions. And the trick is to ask questions that can be answered to very deliberately reason from a base of well-understood textbook quality physics and engineering, not guessing about what might be discovered, uh, not uh, uh, speculating on what inventions might occur in the future, but instead describing systems that can be analyzed in a straightforward way, in a way that looks like a, a set of problems that you might find at the end of, of, uh, of chapters in a physics textbook. Okay, that, kind, that level of analysis. And it turns out you can go quite a long way by doing that. It's not science because it's not studying nature. It's not conventional engineering because one isn't designing something to be built in the near term so that the company will pay you to, to do the work. Instead, it's applying this methodology as one of applying engineering principles to understanding potential technologies that are designed to be analyzable and not designed for high performance per se. So the questions that arise in looking toward the potential of technology in a pathway sense, there are really two. One is what can be made with present tools? That's the standard engineering question. What can we design and make with existing capacities in the laboratory and, and factories? The other question is what will further progress enable? How far can one go? Where does it lead as you use tools to build better tools? You know, if you, if you look at the things around us, uh, aside from the people, uh, pretty much everything here was made by machines. 
sometimes with, with, very, well, with varying amounts of, of help from human hands and increasingly uh, by thoroughly automated systems. Where did those machines come from? Well, by and large, they were made by other machines. And where did those machines come from? Well, if you trace it back from the, the, the sort of the leaves of the technology tree, which were around us, through the branches of machines building, the machines that build these, these consumer products, you trace it back, you find what can be thought of as the trunk of the, of the tree. The machines that build the machines that build the machines. The core of the industrial capital structure. Uh, which tends to center on, on machines that cut steel and make precision shapes that can be used to, to implement machines that cut steel and do other things. And then if you ask where those came from, well, they were made by machines with increasingly the aid of human hands, but less precise machines with materials that weren't as sophisticated. And if you trace it back and back, you find a blacksmith hammering away on iron and sometimes a blacksmith making new tools, better tools, and passing them on to the next generation in a line of progress that led to the Industrial Revolution and to where we are today in macroscopic technologies. And I'll say a little bit more shortly about a path forward from the present day capabilities in the molecular world that is broadly parallel to that pattern of, of historical technology development. This is a picture of one representation of a, uh, rep was one representation of a protein molecule. This is a, shows what the, the pattern of the backbone is. It's actually two superimposed structures. One is, was the result of computational design. The other structure is the result of x-ray crystallographic mapping of an actual physical protein that was made according to that design. This particular design, top seven, marks a particular landmark or, or milestone in the development of a field called protein engineering. Uh, it was the first one that had a completely novel fold. And the reason I, I mention that <coughs> is that in the molecular world, the path forward, the most attractive path forward, leads from our current abilities to do atomically precise fabrication. And that's an atomically precise structure. Here's a, the, the, one, one representation of the, the atomic structure. And here's another with the, the space filling pattern. It's a piece of plastic. It's a polymer with, with mechanical properties that are comparable to epoxy or lucite uh, or, or com well, components that can be used to build a certain quality of machines in the macroscopic world. Uh, these materials, some of them are, are comparable in stiffness to wood, which is also something one can build machines from. So today we have not you know, blacksmithing. Instead, we have the ability to design and fabricate macromolecules with distinct shapes and functions. Looking in biology, we find a very wide range of functions. Uh, motors and sensors and actuators and chemical processing systems and machine, machinery like the ribosome, which takes in digital information and uses that to guide the fabrication of what? Protein molecules, which then are components of, of machines, including, including the ribosomes. Now, back in 1981, I published a paper in the US National uh, Academy of Sciences uh, Proceedings, which argued that protein engineering was possible. At the time, it was thought to be impossible because people thought that you had to understand how proteins, natural proteins, would fold before you could design proteins that would fold. And I pointed out that the scientific problem of figuring out what the, how a natural protein would fold is fundamentally different from the engineering problem of designing something that will behave as you want, that will fold according to plan. And people said, ah, oh, that's interesting. Uh, dubbed that the inverse folding problem. And the, the citation tree grew out of that, which led to the field of now burgeoning field, quite large field of protein engineering and this particular milestone. So that is a line of development in atomically precise fabrication of components that can be used to build machine systems. And it's not called nanotechnology. I, I pulled strings and got one of the, the people behind this work uh, to uh, be awarded a Feynman Prize in nanotechnology. And a colleague later told me that, yeah, he was around when, when, you know, when this guy, David Baker, uh, University of Washington, uh, heard that he was going to be awarded the Feynman Prize in nanotechnology. And he said, he asked, well, why? <laughs> what have I done in nanotechnology? You know, atomically precise devices that can be used for building machines. And by the way, when you think of proteins, uh, don't think of meat. Uh, think of the horn of a bull, 
Uh, alpha keratin is, is an example of a protein. It's a respectable engineering material. Uh, Young's modulus of elasticity of uh, about one gigapascal. So looking at the progress to date in atomically precise fabrication, the long sweep goes from uh, Wohler's synthesis of urea in 1828, eight atoms, up through modern work in the structural DNA where people are routinely designing structures with a million atoms, scale of 100 nanometers, uh, with a degree of reliability that resembles carpentry. You use the double helix as a, as a rod, as a structural member. You use the pairing interactions to direct assembly in a specific way. You bundle the rods together by having the helices exchange strands so that they're, 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 they're held together by this, this crossover. And that has proved to be a way of making a very wide range of structures that can now be integrated with proteins to build um, systems that seem to open some doors to developments that are far along the path of what I will be outlining in a moment. So in human history, we've seen tools used to build better tools. I mentioned blacksmithing on the Industrial Revolution and on to today's dominant nanotechnology, which again, confusingly, is not called nanotechnology, which is uh, the integrated circuit technology. If you ask, where can atomically precise fabrication go with machines being used to build better machines? The answer seems to be remarkably close to an ability to build sort of more or less any stable inorganic structure in atomically precise configurations that can be functional in various ways. Semiconductor structures that are smaller than we can do with today's fab top-down fabrication, uh, with precision, uh, some of the advantages of atomically precise surfaces like specular electron reflection, so you actually have less resistance in a, in a thin wire, uh, non-semiconductor computational devices, high-quality machines, uh, materials of extraordinarily high strength to weight ratio, very wide range of products if you could do that. And to understand that area, again, is a matter of looking at a, this uh, timeless landscape of technology that is implicit in physical law. So this is a two-dimensional diagram of a, of a high-dimensional space of performance metrics. So one dimension in this, one dimension in the space might be the speed of transmission of a signal. Another dimension might be speed of, of, of flight of a spacecraft. Another might be the density of computation, uh, how much computation per unit time in a volume of one cubic centimeter with a power of one watt. Okay, so that would be a dimension. Uh, how good the refrigerator is in your kitchen. Now, you know, the performance metrics for that, another dimension. In any dimension, you find ultimately there's some physical limit. In some cases, it's simple. Speed of transmission of information, we've reached that limit. It's the speed of light. Send photons, there you are. The speed of motion of massive artifacts uh, is a tiny, tiny fraction of the speed of light is all that's been accomplished. We're very far from that limit. In computation, we don't really know where the limits are. The upper bounds that come from physics are absurdly high. It's their upper bounds, but it's clear there must be some tighter bound because there's, uh, you just can't, can't do what the fundamental, very fundamental uh, limits suggest you, <coughs> suggest you might uh, if you drop the reality of matter and just, just keep quantum mechanics in a more abstract sense. So there's a domain between what's been demonstrated, what exists by engineering, what's clearly forbidden by physics, and in between there are physical systems that can exist and function, and some of them can be designed and analyzed. So that domain for exploration is what I term here exploratory engineering. And I said a little bit before about how that relates to science and engineering, it sort of falls into the cracks between them. And the characteristic activity is to define designs out in this space that is of possibilities that is beyond current engineering practice and analyze them and set a lower bound on what can be accomplished in the, in the real world given a fabrication capability. Uh, a, 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 someone undertook this exercise in understanding space flight some time ago. Uh, he's widely known as the father of astronautics. Uh, after the, 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 uh, the Soviets threw him in prison for a while, they then let him out and, and called him a hero and gave him a pension. 
And he worked out the, the basics of, of astronautics, chemical fueled rockets, uh, what was required for life in space, uh, trajectories, velocities, a lot of quantitative analysis, what would be the best fuels. And he worked that out in a, uh, by, by lamplight in a, a log uh, building. He worked by day as a school teacher, uh, studied, uh, invented astronautics in the evening. And his name was Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, and he did his work, his key work, uh, in the late 1800s. How could he do that? Well, uh, physics doesn't change, and he was able to explore some of the implications of physics and strength of materials and the energy of combustion of hydrogen, liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen to understand some of the performance, potential performance of space vehicles. So he identified you know, uh, some, some points out in this space that have since been reached by technology. And in a broadly similar way, we can look at points that can be reached by atomically precise fabrication technologies. And ongoing exploration can give a, describe an, an envelope of possibilities that where you can be confident that technology can go at least this far, and to be really confident means you have a high, rather high confidence that it will in fact be able to go further. So that is the nature of the game, and some of the most interesting possibilities come from some particular materials and some particular kinds of devices. The materials are strong covalent solids, materials like diamond, silicon, silicon carbide, graphene, uh, uh, aluminum oxide, a uh, whole, whole family of materials that are, have a strong covalent character in their bonding. They are light elements high in the periodic table, high into the right. They're common elements, and they form strong, low-density materials that, it turns out, can be very well modeled by existing uh, computational chemistry software. Uh, the computational models that can describe flexible molecule, computational models that could describe flexible molecules and how they behave in solution are more than accurate enough to describe the same kinds of bonds in rigid configurations uh, where you don't have water molecules around. Uh, so the tools that have been developed for practical problems today are actually better than what is necessary to analyze this kind of structure and machinery that can be made from these structures when one is able to fabricate them. And regarding fabrication, uh, these, this kind of computational analysis can be used to guide the design and, and validation of fabrication processes that work by guiding reactive molecules on specific trajectories, keeping them from, going to, from, from encountering targets that they should not encounter, avoiding reactions that should not happen, which turns out to be the, the primary problem in controlled chemical synthesis, not to make reactions happen, but to make all the rest of the reactions not happen. By guiding the motion, one can prevent the wrong reactions from happening, make the right reactions happen. In this case, it just shows the simplest case of depositing a hydrogen atom someplace and removing one. The ability to shuffle hydrogen atoms around on a surface is, is important. So, if one has atomically precise mechanisms that can guide the motion of reactive molecules, then one would be able to build atomically precise rigid structures of the sort that are necessary to build atomically precise machines that can guide the motion of molecules. So just as today we have an industrial infrastructure based on steel tools where collectively the machinery in the factories in the world can make all of the kinds of devices that you find in factories and more which is why we have products other than factories just producing factories, and also why we, we see better technologies over time. So in the world today, we have a capital infrastructure where machines make machines in a, in a, a comprehensive, coherent way. Uh, we now can understand how a similar comprehensive set of, of, of fabrication processes, making the kinds of machines necessary to perform the fabrication processes, how that can function in the nanoscale world. So the key is rigid, atomically precise machines. And in my book, uh, which I should, was meant, meant to mention, the first slide had uh, the title of my book, and in the lower left it said Oxford Martin School. And I would like to thank the Oxford Martin School uh, for inviting me here uh, from the United States uh, to finish work on that book, which was published uh, not terribly, terribly many months ago. 
and also for inviting me to stay long term. I now have no plans to be anywhere other than Oxford for the, for the foreseeable future because I like it here a lot. Um, so that's something I intended to say with the first slide. Missed entirely. Okay, so diving back into the, into the midst of rigid, atomically precise machines. Uh, what do we mean by machines? Well, you know, things like gears and bearings and shafts and motors and sliding things and four bar linkages and toggles and, and detents and all the little things that mechanical engineers use to make articulated machines that solve motion problems, move things and put things in place and so on in a factory. And some samples of the kinds of things used in these machines are found in, uh, well, let's see, all of these gears might be found in places like an automobile power transmission chain uh, and many other places. Uh, so these are some relatively complicated cases of, 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 of gears. And as test cases, they're kind of interesting. You know, one can design functional equivalents of each of these at a scale where well, the, the diameters of these objects are, uh, that are shown here, the, the first two characteristic dimensions are maybe three nanometers in diameter. The spheres are, all represent atoms. Uh, the atoms are carbon, silicon, hydrogen, uh, nitrogen, oxygen, and sulfur. Uh, now, one, one of them also has some phosphorus. All you know, common materials in the, again, upper right-hand corner of the periodic table. And the configurations can be modeled by doing energy minimization in a computational model of these molecular systems. And one can also do molecular dynamics and examine their motion, uh, power density, uh, energy dissipation, and so on. It turns out that physics likes these. These things work remarkably well. Uh, friction uh, can be remarkably low. Uh, static friction can be remarkably close to zero, for at least for, for bearings, and pretty good for, for, rolling, uh, for, for rolling gears. Uh, I, I could go on. Uh, <laughs> there, there are many characteristics that make problems that, that are prominent in mechanical engineering go away in this domain. Excuse me, yes? Uh, these things exist, or they like oh, oh these, these are computational models. Yeah, but are they models of something that was created? No, these, these are models of, uh, uh, if, if we're doing blacksmithing today, uh, these, are, these are models of, uh, <laughs> okay, the, the gears to the left are to blacksmithing more or less as the gears to the right are to present day macromolecular uh, synthetic methods. Uh, they're out of reach. We can understand what kinds of tools could build them. We can model them with, with great confidence and you know, more than adequate accuracy for engineering purposes with present tools. But these were made by, by at a computer screen <laughs> uh, saying where the atoms are and where the bonds are and then turning on simulated physics to, uh, to see how they, how they behave. So there are some characteristics of this class of technologies. Uh, I say physics, physics quote unquote, likes them. Uh, physics is telling us that this is a, a great way to do manufacturing, and for two reasons. One is matter is made of atoms and molecules, and if you work at the, with the fundamental building blocks, you can do things that you can't if you're just pushing matter around in a, in a sloppy, messy way, cutting and molding and, and doing etching and, and so on. The other one is, has to do with speed. At a small, well, at, for machines, generally speaking, uh, the characteristic speeds in meters per second are independent of size. Uh, that's just, if, if you do that, you find that the accelerations are the same, uh, the stresses in the materials are the same, the ratio of vibrational frequencies to mechanical motion frequencies are identical, the, the shapes traced in space-time, you scale space and you scale time equally, you're keeping velocities constant, you end up with the same, the same shapes and patterns of, of stress. So that's natural scaling. And it follows from that that the time for a motion, one rotation of a, of a, of a, of a bearing, uh, one reciprocating motion of, of some, some other mechanical element, it's proportional to scale. Twice the distance, twice the time to cover the distance. By the same token, operating frequencies are inverse to scale. And if you scale your machines down by a factor of a million, from say one cycle per second, you get frequencies that are a megahertz. And in the world of, of microscale machines, the, this, is, this is commonplace. You see megahertz uh, frequencies quite, you know, in, in, in vibrating devices in, in, uh, in micro machines quite routinely. 
And again, you know, same material, same stress, et cetera, purely a matter of scaling and uh, mechanical, mechanical scaling laws. So looking at these gears and so on, the actual scale factor for roughly equivalent systems is about a factor of 10 to the 7. And if you consider that in the context of manufacturing, a system that's moving parts and putting them together, if you scale the parts proportionally to the machine, then the throughput percentage of, of the machine's mass processed per cycle is scale independent. The throughput in terms of kilograms per second per kilogram of machine mass depends on the frequency of machine operation. And therefore, the scaling provides a factor of 10 million in throughput per unit mass, which is comparable to the difference between chemical explosives and thermonuclear explosives, uh, sailing a ship around the world and sending a vehicle out of the solar system, or working with an abacus and having a, 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 a a, a silicon computer at gigahertz. It's that, that kind of ratio. Actually, that one's a larger ratio. Uh, but there are very few ratios that large in, in engineering, and this is one that physics is promising, promising us, given that we build machines of this class. So uh, devices, you may machines, build factories. Uh, mechanical engineers know about this kind of thing, provide the right palette of, of components. You can, provide, you can build a certain range of machines. You know, axioms uh, give you a superstructure of theorems. Components give you a superstructure of feasible systems. And that knowledge transfers. You can make analogous components. You can build analogous systems and do a wholesale importation of knowledge from mechanical engineering to this domain. You know, the bearings work differently, but they're bearings. The gears uh, in interact differently when they mesh, but they're gears. And it's not much more different than the difference between building out of metal or plastic uh, in, in many respects. Uh, I guess that's true more of the fabrication processes, uh, which have great diversity. So a couple of conceptual tools. Uh, one is, well, looking at digital, the, the current leading nanotechnology, digital electronic systems, and then comparing those to prospective not here yet, <laughs> prospective uh, nanomechanical systems for guiding the motion of molecules and, and doing fabrication. In digital electronics, you have arrays of nanoscale devices, uh, gigahertz frequencies. They make patterns of bits and bytes and do general purpose information processing. Not specialized machines. You know, here's a telephone. There's a, tel there's a, there's a television. Uh, over here is a camera. Over here is a dark room. Instead, you have digital devices that do all of these things, which would have greatly surprised engineers. The underlying principle is working with very small discrete parts at high frequencies using a general purpose mechanism. Very analogous in atomically precise manufacturing. Arrays of devices, here mechanical. Nanoscale size giving higher frequencies, only megahertz rather than gigahertz because you know, electronics is faster. Patterns of bits and bytes on one side correspond abstractly at least to patterns of atoms and molecules. Discrete components, the smallest components in their, their domain. Uh, it turns out that the operations can be discrete and, uh, and made insensitive to, to thermal noise, to thermal fluctuations, uh, using physical principles that are essentially the same as what you find in electronics in terms of uh, the, uh, having a distinct energy gap, a distinct energy barrier between the right state and the wrong state and always having a discretization of results. And the final parallel is uh, that the result is general purpose physical production. Rather than having a host of specialized kinds of manufacturing, this is a kind of manufacturing technology base that would be more like 3D printing in having its, its breadth of, of, of potential products. Uh, let's see, precision follows rather directly. Uh, you can see how a process like this might be clean because you're not, you know, diluting toxic materials in water and then dumping it into a river. Instead, you're controlling the, the flow of materials with, with precision. Uh, fast, uh, it turns out that efficiency follows low resource consumption. Better materials, you need less of them. Common materials, don't go to war in Africa to fight for tungsten and molybdenum. Opens new realms of technology, uh, obviously. And again, I would emphasize that this class of technologies that I'm describing here, not yet physically accessible, is very accessible to design analysis exercises. Textbook physics and chemistry, if there's anything new, it's a mistake. 
and the great power of it, some of the surprising consequences coming from elementary mechanical scaling laws. So again, parallel, 3D printing. Imagine that you had something like a 3D printer. Uh, simple raw materials in, digital information in, energy in, things happen inside, parts move around, small bits of matter are arranged in a, in a way controlled by your digital inputs and outcomes. You know, uh, sort of any any shape of object within certain uh, certain uh, tolerances in these uh, additive manufacturing systems. Well, imagine that you have boxes again, simple materials in, energy, digital information, arrays of very small high frequency devices giving much higher throughput. Digital printer, 3D printers often take hours to produce a product. Here, the times are for something more massive and more intricate would be typically measured in minutes. Uh, a wider range of materials than, you, than are, can be made by industry and laboratories today rather than a narrower range and with the precision being atomic precision rather than a relatively coarse grained. So analogous to 3D printing, analogous to digital electronics, uh, notable differences from both, but a lot can be understood by thinking in terms of those analogies. So I'd just like to quickly walk through some known possibilities, which largely follow from being able to make small things and to make strong materials and products at low cost. Uh, set of comparisons. Uh, supercomputers, uh, more or less present generation. This is a little bit, little, little while ago. Uh, you know, megawatts, tons, hundreds of millions of dollars is the sort of, sort of scale. A device with a similar computational throughput but made with atomically precise manufacturing, uh, could have a thousand times the information throughput, be an air-cooled device, uh, and you can see lots and lots of, of zeros in the ratios for, for power, uh, weight, and cost. Uh, aerospace, aluminum structures, have been costly to make. It's hard to make them with, with low enough defect rates to be reliable. Uh, the materials are stressed toward their limits and they end up being rather heavy. Most of the mass that a space shuttle put up into space was the vehicle and not the payload. Better materials, lower cost, uh, uh, defects that are scarce and, and nanoscale points to the ability to make vehicles that have a small fraction of the mass, makes it much easier to access space. Much, much lower cost, order of a dollar per kilogram instead of a hundred, hundred thousand dollars per kilogram and greatly uh, much more reliability. So one unexpected aspect of the 21st century, given that one crosses some key technology thresholds here, is that the world becomes larger than the Earth. All these science fiction dreams of the human race and Konstantin Tsiolkovsky's dream of the human race expanding beyond the Earth. The problem there has been a manufacturing problem. We can't make spacecraft with high performance and low cost. With superior manufacturing, a lot of science fiction all of a sudden moves from the, well, that was a nice dream category to, oh, we can do it. Speaking of aerospace systems and lower cost and higher performance, uh, the ability to uh, expand the, for, for a given investment, expand the size of arsenals by a factor of 1,000 is enough to suggest why there might be a temptation for an arms race in this technology. There are many, many other potential applications in the military area. And uh, one of the main reasons that I have been attempting to articulate a picture of the prospects here and a fairly comprehensive picture, in turn, not, not a narrow slice, but a, a broad picture of consequences, is because there are some very important decisions to be made at the level of national policy that make a difference between a cooperative path and a path to an unstable and dangerous arms race. And I'll, I'll, I'll point to a reference that, that goes into that further uh, at the end. Uh, so more benign applications. Uh, today we have limits on food production. Arable land is getting scarce. A sub substantial fraction of the, of the Earth's net primary photosynthetic production is now channeled into, into agriculture. Uh, the most productive and attractive for, for living things ecosystems in the world are precisely the places where agricultural work, agriculture works well, and therefore much of the vibrant, uh, many of the more vibrant parts of the biosphere have been paved over with soybeans. If you could increase the productivity of agriculture by a factor of 10 and make it less dependent on weather and climate, you could decrease the footprint of agriculture, increase total food production, 
uh, decrease pollution of water, uh, move agriculture to areas that are not biologically productive sp spontaneously, and the key is solving a manufacturing problem, which is being able to make at low cost and large quantity the physical capital infrastructure necessary to do enclosed uh, greenhouse agriculture. Uh, increases in productivity are known. It's just too expensive today. Why? The cost of making the necessary physical artifacts. So one more area is energy. As I mentioned earlier, if we could make uh, superior photovoltaics at low cost, the energy situation and greenhouse gas emission situation would very rapidly look different. Uh, today, photovoltaics are relatively expensive, fragile. Mounting them is 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 large part of the cost. It will be a larger fraction of the cost as as the cost of the cells declines. But if you're able to make photovoltaic devices that are small and made of robust materials and can be embedded in a matrix that is strong and flexible and can be made to adhere to surfaces and, and uh, be, be tough and abrasion resistant and produce rolls, kind of like rolls of black plastic of this stuff at low cost per kilogram, then one can look at a future in which we take roads and uh, they become darker roads and uh, basically you resurface them with a tough, abrasion-resistant photovoltaic material. And simply resurfacing roads and, uh, and, and rooftops is enough to produce uh, on, on the order of the amount of energy that civilization consumes today, the rough order. Uh, and there are also prospects for decreasing the amount of energy needed. And of course, there's a lot of land in the world that does not consist of, of roads and roofs. This is a sort of uh, an, an example of how, how, how much one could reduce the, the footprint of an industrial civilization by having solving certain manufacturing problems. And I would like to return to uh, the, the, the most famous global problem of the day, which is greenhouse gas accumulation. And, uh, and climate disruption. What has been observed to date is a very steady and actually accelerating rise in CO2. And this Mauna Loa Observatory has this data series going way back to the late 1950s. And uh, the world being what it is and the US being what it is, uh, they're being defunded apparently. They're looking for a private, it's run a Kickstarter I suppose, uh, uh, to, to maintain this, this data series. But expectations are, given that people are working their way out of poverty by, by using today's industrial technology, and it's a little bit hard to say that's a bad thing, is that CO2 emissions are going to continue. And if they continue at their present rate, the levels will, will continue to climb at roughly the present rate. And it's more likely that emissions will increase than, rather than decrease, and that the rate of increase in CO2 will increase as well. So that is the pattern of expectation, and increasingly that seems to be a very bad thing like to have a future that looks something more like this, where the levels don't just level off, but are brought down to the, the pre-industrial level, preferably rather rapidly. Oh, well, why can't we do that? Well, again, it's a manufacturing problem. It requires a lot of energy. The thermodynamic work of compression of this dilute CO2 gas, the excess above industrial levels that's expected in this time frame, it's about 10 to the 21st joules of free energy required. You need devices that capture CO2 molecules, transfer them to a high density uh, uh, of CO2 to liquid density. If that's done thermodynamically efficiently, it's about that much energy, and there are ways of doing it with that kind of efficiency. For scale, that's 30 terawatt years of electric power, if you use electric power, which is uh, appropriate for running compressors. Current global electric power production time average is about three terawatts. So this is, three civil, this is one civilization decade worth of electric power. Well, which has to, of course, be from, from non-carbon consuming sources to make this be of any use. Well, that turns out to be a manufacturing problem. If we could build photovoltaic arrays with the area of that little uh, green square, which I've put here in the empty quarter of Saudi Arabia, which seemed like a good place, empty quarter, the equivalent of that area in the course of 10 years uh, would provide enough energy to accomplish this task of CO2 removal. I very much suggest that no one count on being able to do this. 
If uh, people start saying, oh, don't worry, because we'll be able to do that, I, I will, 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 will join with, uh, with, with people in green politics to say, don't assume this. But it is a real prospect. You got a manufacturing technology problem. So here to there, pathway. A lot more can be said about pathways than could be said a couple of years ago, but abstractly and generally speaking, one needs to develop manufacturing capabilities that are beyond what we have today. Therefore, they can be regarded as places in this possibility space that I outlined earlier. And some of these potential developments are stepping stones, tools that can be used to build better tools, leading to a threshold of scalable, atomically precise fabrication, a certain range of devices, a certain kind of performance, uh, leads to scalable production, and the ability then to access a wide range of very high performance technologies at low cost. Uh, to put names to some of these stages, today we're doing macromolecular self-assembly, uh, folded biopolymers, and that's rather far along, but primarily applied for academic and biological and medical purposes, because you don't find a lot of systems engineers in the molecular sciences, it's been the key problem within reach along lines of development that are now rather well understood are positional or stereotactic assembly systems that would guide the motion of molecular building blocks uh, not relying purely on self-assembly and, and brownian motion to align parts but but now constraining where they go that relieves some of the design burden in self-assembly and leads to improvements in the materials that can be made there's a cycle of advance leads to scalable apm level technologies downstream and then to revolutionary applications. So the me takeaway message is there. There is, we're not there. We're not within a step or two of there, but there is a visible pathway. The length of time, that's not, that's a, that if one, one came out with a the number there, it would be a prediction. And as I've said, uh, the body of this is not about predictions. It's about what physics tells us about artifacts and what they can do if you make them. Uh, so, seeing that there is a path is an appropriate task for exploratory engineering. Speaking to questions of time and cost is not. That said, one can talk about time and, time and cost, but it has to be recognized as a, as a separate kind of question. So, uh, finally, atomically precise manufacturing does seem like a road to an unexpected kind of future. Something very different from what people expect, something that will require a second look at a wide range of assumptions. And what I'm encouraging people to, to do today is to make a little bit of space in public discourse, policy discourse, scientific discourse, for planning steps in the research labs that have range of applications, including climbing this ladder, and putting into the, the range of scenarios for the 21st century, initially a small note saying that there is this other set of possibilities that needs to be thought about. And I think that as people engage, they will find that there is reason to engage deeper and that the amount of uh, policy analysis, uh, systems engineering, design, and so on that people feel is appropriate given expanded knowledge will increase and that eventually one will see a very strong and increasingly urgent program in this area. But right now, the main message is that there is low-hanging fruit in the form of available information, which I think can be understood, absorbed, judged, and when judged, is compelling. My current activity is to, uh, is to attempt to get over that barrier. Uh, there has been some history in this area, and if this sounds controversial, it's largely because of crazy things that were said in the 1990s and uh, became part of US politics circa the year 2000, which is part of the reason that nanotechnology was defined to be almost everything but this. And, and atomically precise fabrication and semiconductors. So what is called nanotechnology is important and valuable, and it's almost entirely different from this, which has been a source of enormous confusion. So more information. Uh, this is a book that is based on my MIT doctoral dissertation. It's a big, thick work of, of applied physics. Uh, that goes from uh, molecular potential energy functions through dynamics, through uh, uh, fabrication processes, systems engineering, uh, a lot of stuff, and it actually costs money. This is for available for free. 
It's the results, it's a set of PDFs from a uh, technology road mapping exercise uh, held in conjunction with several of the US national labs. Uh, I was co-leader on that and it charts in low resolution a pathway from here to these sorts of technologies. Uh, and Radical Abundance is the book that I uh, completed here at the Oxford Martin School that is, is now in print. And finally, new resource, only available for a few months, though the publication date is listed there as May. Uh, it's only been on, on, on the web for three months at this point. Uh, this is a 105-page report that talks that spans a range from technical discussions through uh, discussions of institutional considerations in focusing research more effectively through policy considerations and uh, implications for national uh, interest and national security policy. The abstract is in Chinese. Uh, I'm a co-author, Dennis Pamlin, who is a Swede, who is a member of the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, interestingly, is a, is a co-author. Uh, a number of uh, the participants in this are with the Chinese Academy of Sciences. So I'm encouraging people to, uh, uh, in the West to uh, make sure that uh, suitable attention is given to these topics. You can download this report from the Oxford Martin School's website and that Google text string uh, uh, will bring it. So with that, I'd like to throw it open for questions. Thank you. Well, it will be interesting to see. Uh, there certainly are incentives for industries in a wide range of areas to not want to see profound change that would change the valuation, for example, of resources in the ground uh, uh, or of, of established technologies, uh, uh, long-term capital investments, and so on. My expectation is that by the time that industry leaders take prospects like this seriously enough to consider taking some action, they will, these prospects will have been taken seriously beforehand uh, by policy intellectuals, by uh, people in, uh, concerned with national security, uh, people planning research programs, and that there will be a strong force to move forward from those sources. And interestingly, no one in a position to say no. Uh, you know, if, if companies in the West say we don't like this, well, the most effective thing they could do would be to make sure that it happens in China instead. Uh, uh, so there are many parties in a position to move technologies forward. There's really no one who stands in a, in a position to, to block it. And with tremendous rewards in many different dimensions, I, I think that the, the motives will, motivations are sufficient to, to push forward. But no doubt with turbulence for the, the reason you're saying. Um, the answer is, is technically yes, and I don't really like space elevators. <laughs> uh, people have done, actually the first calculus problem that I ever worked in earnest was a, was a space elevator uh, calculation using graphite whisker strength. That was a 13 to 1 taper ratio with that particular material. Anyway, uh, there are people who are very excited about space elevators, uh, which would be you have a, have a center of mass, roughly speaking, uh, at geosynchronous orbit, and uh, mass out beyond geosynchronous orbit, and a long, tapered, very strong cable going all the way down to Earth's surface. It requires an extraordinarily high strength to weight ratio to, to have that not break and be able to carry a load. What I have not seen anyone do is to explain how such a thing can survive impact with micrometeoroids. Uh, the, the kinetic energy produced by breaking a fiber is like the kinetic energy of a high, ener of a high power rifle bullet. Uh, the, materials, the, the materials that are accelerated when you break a fiber are like sh shooting rifle bullets at the structure 
And I would like to see someone explain how you don't get a cascade failure that would be catastrophic. So the current designs I don't believe work. Someone may be clever enough to come up with one that does. And I think there are better ways of getting things into space. So it's a qualified yes. So Randall, you kind of mentioned that the current physical limits associated with computations are ridiculously high. Mm. Is that right that? Uh, I believe the be best I've heard of, or the most best known, are from Seth Lloyd, who is at MIT and has done a lot on, on uh, quantum computation. And they're, they're taking fundamental physical constants and, and putting together dimensionless numbers. And they're you know, like uh, you know, 10 to the 30th or 10 to the 300th operations uh, per, per cubic centimeter or per cubic nothing. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm deliber deliberately, deliberately speaking very loosely to point in the direction of numbers that are, by any reasonable standard of, of behavior of physical systems, matter, they're unphysical. So they, they're, they're, they're more closely, closely related to, say, the, the, the Planck length and, and mass uh, than, than, uh, than to the properties of, of, of carbon fibers or, or electrical conductors. Like limits to the energy. So, like, um, it is, for instance, said that we need a certain amount of energy, like energy for removing a single bit of information. Erasing the information, yes. That's exactly like right. Concentrated calculation. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, that's a subtle question. Um, it turns out that computation, if you just take inputs and you have some, some set of, of, of causal Boolean operations that goes through a chain and produces an output here. If you don't read it and don't do anything to record it, in principle, all those operations can be reversed. And in the limit of proper design and in the limit of slow motion, it's asymptotically thermodynamically reversible. So there's no energy cost. It turns out that to copy that information, in a cycle where you, you, take, you take registers, you record bits, and then you clear them to record more bits. Each cycle of writing in erasure costs natural log 2 kT uh, worth of free energy, or natural log 2 k of, of entropy. And that's a very small quantity compared to present day computational systems. How often you have to record and erase in a computational system is unclear. It's a very soft design design a connected question. But yes, that is the fundamental limit. And it's, it's way beyond where we are today. Um, you said that we are quite far from atomically precise manufacturing today, no? Hmm. But like, you see, for example, IBM make like, funny demonstrations of like, hmm. placing atoms it seems atomically precise. Yes. And isn't that atomically precise manufacturing? Even though it's, uh, it's manufacturing. atomically precise. It demonstrates some of the physical principles of using mechanical systems to guide uh, molecular or atomic motion with discrete results. But the scale, the, the, the rates are slow, and the scale is one structure you know, where 100, 100 atoms is a relatively large number. Uh, in a period that would typically be, I don't know what the state of the art is, but it would be more like minutes or hours than it would be like microseconds. Um, and compare that, compare that to what can be done in the laboratory without, a, without a, you know, a, the kinds of apparatus necessary to do the, that kind of scanning probe operation, uh, can be done with, with materials you can order by FedEx and you mix them in a beaker and you warm it up and you cool it slowly. And the result is a trillion instances of million atom atomically precise structures in 3D, uh, which can include functional machines of, of various sorts, uh, binding sites that could be used to organize other structures. Now, the chemistry-based, the molecular sciences-based approach to atomically precise fabrication is far beyond anything uh, that one sees in the scanning probe technologies. So to the, extent that, to the extent that people regard those as representative of progress, they're looking in the wrong place, is my view. Could we principally use this model by IBM, for example, to build one of the middle gear mechanisms, at least to test uh, I don't see any way to do it with, with that particular class of technology. Everything that has been done to date involves moving 
atoms and molecules around on a flat surface, just one layer. In principle, one could begin to, to stack things. To the best of my knowledge, that hasn't been done yet. It would be another level of difficulty. And to make freestanding, strong, covalently bonded structures, uh, there have been people who have proposed going down, down that path, and it does not strike me as promising. Part of the confusion is that some people have thought that's the path that I advocate, but it, the path forward that I find attractive uh, is one that confusingly does not resemble the end product. So uh, try, trying to directly make devices of this sort seems to me to not work. Try using present abilities to make better and better quality materials, more intricate and functional devices using the existing massively parallel you know, again, million atom scale, trillion, trillion artifact uh, simultaneously. Uh, refining that line of technology to the point where one is making devices of this quality uh, in outline, uh, we can see how to do that. It's a, it's a smooth technology gradient. that I find most exciting are in computational modeling and design in the molecular sciences and in actual laboratory research in the molecular sciences. So then the question is, where is the relevant part of that being done? And the answer is primarily in academic laboratories today um, with supporting supporting work in chemical synthesis technologies certainly comes out of the chemical industry. Uh, and you know, there are also national laboratories and so on. But primarily work in pure science or in science intended to advance biology and biomedicine, which is very much about macromolecules and, and, and controlling them. Uh, so it's widely disseminated, and I think that, that's where the most important work is to be found today. DNA origami and protein folding are what I spend, when, when I think about the structural side of early generation technologies, those are the ones that I th I'm thinking about and the people I'm talking with and uh, conferring with, and it's looking rather exciting. That and, uh, and people working on the photophysics of uh, azobenzenes. Mm -hmm. uh, but I wanted another constraint which uh, is also uh, important. Uh, the elements uh, mm -hmm. of this uh, device which would be capturing uh, the CO2 molecules mm -hmm. would have to have the chance to encounter these molecules. And I wondered uh, um, how this would uh, Relate to the possible size of this yes. device and uh, the, the operation time of it? Uh, that is also a, a crucial consideration. Mm -hmm. You have to have enough airflow over enough surface area to have the kind of, of, of fine scale contact. And for reasonable flow speeds, it appears that the scale is comparable to the, to the scale of the photovoltaic arrays, is the, is the short answer. It's a how to do that in a more or less optimal design is a messier question. Uh, it deserves more attention, but a very, a very rough first look says it's important. Uh, it's on, on the same scale as, as the, some of the other tasks, roughly. Um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, important and, and not, a, not a showstopper. So it's, it's, been, it's been considered possible from that point of view to, uh, it's been considered feasible to, to build it within uh, certain uh, feasible size. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, you need a large cross section of area that 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 air is flowing through. Uh, imagine uh, a, a large intake uh, associated with that large intake is a, a quite a large surface area of you know at a coarse scale it's a membrane and air goes goes through the membrane. At a fine scale, the membrane consists of many parallel surfaces, 
uh, at a distance such that air molecules going through have a reasonable chance of encountering one side or the other. Um, and so uh, inflow, uh, sort of, this is just one level of, of a branching channel structure. Uh, there's actual, the opt optimal structures have a fractal quality. Uh, but you know, in, in between layers, interdigitating inter another level is, uh, is probably the right thing to do in this case. Have a lot of surface area, modest airflow, uh, modest amount of, of resistance to, to, to the flow, so the energy required to, to accomplish the airflow is, is small compared to the thermodynamic work of compression. Uh, the capture area, comparable to the area of the photovoltaics uh, at a, a rough non-optimized analysis. I should probably sit down and, uh, and, and look through that more closely. I went far enough to say, that's not a showstopper, and, then, and then, then postponed looking at it more closely, which is a standard thing to do in systems engineering. Say, here are all the functional slots that need to be filled. And the first pass asks, is it plausible that all of them can be filled? If so, then maybe it's worth looking more closely. If one of them clearly can't be, you will think about something else. And then subsequent passes, you refine and, and get a more quantitative and concrete description of preferably multiple ways of filling the functional slots. And this one is taken to a, a very rough level, which you know, says, yeah, you could do that. And something about this big will do it. And you can probably do much better with a good design. So that's the situation. Uh, would it be realistic that you talked about these photovoltaics that you could play some roles? Mm -hmm. Um, but obviously safety also plays a role. Mm -hmm. so would it be possible to create some which have the safety of roles and the capability of uh, getting energy from sunlight mm -hmm. at a relatively cheap price? Uh, what, what property do you want? Safety. In, um, uh, you can make you can make it as as, as unsafe as present day roads. <laughs> you could have a uh, if as long as you're going to the trouble of, of putting down a surface, you can presumably make it be a, a better a better surface. Something that, for example, uh, won't ice up because you can put energy into it when you want to. Uh, a better texture, uh, passing water through instead of having it having it be slick on the surface. You know, that's the the kind of engineering that that one would think of at the structural level. Uh, and in practice, you might want to do things that are more radical revisions of, of the whole transportation system and automobiles and so on. Uh, turns out that physics, the physics of motors also it works very well at a small scale. The same throughput principles in manufacturing, same scaling laws apply to electric motors and um, are highly relevant to the power density of chemomechanical conversion systems. So if you were to build something like a present-day automobile with the kinds of, of engine technologies that this, this fabrication technology would, would allow, uh, you, you, you'd ask, well, you know, where is the engine? You know, it's just luggage compartments. The answer is the engines are where you would have put the bearings in a conventional automobile. Uh, very compact, high power density and efficiency. So that's just a, a hint of one of the tools that could be used in a systems engineering context to make some very different kinds of vehicles. Perhaps safer. It, it seems that you're, I suppose, promoting the, the chemical synthesis type of method to produce precise mm -hmm. manufacturing that you will then empirically limit the fine purity, um, which would then obviously make it no longer atomically precise but very mm -hmm. natural. And so, how, I was quite surprised that your, your thought of like the, I suppose, pick and place type method with production of an atomically precise ad layer is the first mm. step to be able to then make secondary layers and so mm. forth. Mm. So uh, I suppose my, my, comment, my, my question is somewhere along the lines of the, the two things. What, yeah. should, shouldn't that be one of the initial steps to, to focus on an atomically oh. precise single atomic layer yeah. and then look at how we can scale it up and how can mm -hmm. we do it? Yes. Well, if, you, if you're not concerned about transverse control, of course, there's already atomic layer deposition, which, which gives one-dimensional atomically precise control and is very useful in a lot of present-day technologies, uh, epitaxy with one layer at a time. Uh, there's a company, uh, Zyvex, which was founded, it was actually inspired by, by that book Nanosystems and has since gone off into some very profitable areas having to do with carbon nanotube technologies. Uh, they've been pursuing what they call um, patterned ALE, patterned atomic layer epitaxy. 
And I mentioned that it's useful to be able to shuffle hydrogen atoms around. Uh, their approach is you start with a silicon surface, a hydrogenated 111 surface, and then use a, an STM to remove single hydrogen atoms at designated locations. And then you do the kinds of operations that are used in atomic layer epitaxy, but the reactions only occur where you remove the hydrogen. So that's an approach to building layers with lateral control of where atoms go. Uh, they've been working on that for quite a while. I, I think it's reasonable to expect that they will have success uh, and have some range of applications, possibly in sensors. But to go from there to intricate machine systems with many moving parts, I don't see a roadmap. If someone has a proposal, that's great. I certainly encourage research in this area. It has independent value. It can be a test bed for some of the physical operations and principles of atomically precise manufacturing. But as an actual pathway, uh, no one has explained to me how, how that would work. But regarding impurities in the, the chemical approach, it's, I think, interesting to note that the fabrication of you know, the present day uh, uh, electronic nanosystems is done in the cleanest environments people can manage, uh, basically. Use extremely pure semiconductors, use a clean environment with respect to dust, uh, clean reagents all the way through. Because the technologies are very, very sensitive to, to impurities by the, the nature of the semiconductor physics and some of the, the accumulation of, 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 uh, of, of disrupted structure or, or damaged structure if you try to build on top of something that has a dust grain. It's interesting to note that the atomically precise fabrication in uh, structural DNA nanotechnology and protein engineering is done in laboratories where no particular effort is made to keep things clean. In the case of structural DNA nanotechnology, they don't even purify the, the staple strand uh, reagents. Uh, and that's because the self-assembly process itself is a, in that particular case at least, works as a rather effective purification process. If a component doesn't have the right structure, it doesn't fit and doesn't bind. So that, that doesn't always, always give you everything that you want, but it helps. So the general strategy that seems to, to address that kind of problem is that you start with ordinarily pure reagents. You do chemical synthesis processes or, or biosynthesis processes, and you get something that has a lot of what you want and a lot of what you don't want. Uh, impurities, uh, side re products of side reactions. The next step is to do a chemical purification process that provides 99%, uh, let's say, or better, of the desired molecules and low level of impurities. So now you bring together two such products, two, two ki kinds of molecular structures for another chemical reaction or a uh, self-assembly reaction. And most of the product is, is, is your intended target. A certain fraction isn't. You either let that fraction continue, uh, which can cause problems going forward, or you do another separation process. And that iterative process of assembly and separation, where you, you throw out the, the mistakes along the way, can give, if each step is, is, is high in yield and you have a convergent assembly process, can give a high yield of product that in the end has uh, defects, rates that are low enough that it's reasonable to use the label atomically precise, and sometimes it's literally true. So that's the general picture, uh, which is, is derived quite directly from current laboratory procedure. These are important considerations, and that's how they're addressed uh, with uh, difficulty and success. Okay, I think we'll wrap it up there. Thank you all very much for coming. Uh, we do have refreshments outside, so please do stick around. Yeah. And once again, could you thank, uh, join me in thanking Dr. Director for coming tonight. Thank you. And thank you.